I'm over overwhelmed. I thank you so much for coming to this 80th birthday party. I have just barely made it to my 80th birthday party. <laughs> you can see by looking at me and by my uh, nosebleed this morning that uh, uh, my health has been giving me some trouble the last six months especially, and the last month even more than that. And the last week has been especially chaotic, and I was in the emergency room on Tuesday night, you know, and uh, but luckily it was not anything terrible, but let's hope I can get through this talk. Um, I, um, I know what I want to say, I have an outline of what I'd like to say, but I haven't been able to make it into a really polished talk yet, so we'll go, go through it step by step. And um, in my mind, uh, I've been thinking back on this issue of <clears throat> how rapidly science is, is advancing now. You know, and it's just impossible to keep up with what's going on. And I guess in every generation, scientists say something like that. Uh, this puts a lot of stress on the community. It puts a lot of stress on the, you know, the civilian community. This and the uh, large, large gap between the wealthy and the poor make the country more and more unstable. And uh, well, I thought one thing I could do that would be useful would talk about my memory of things when I was an undergraduate and a graduate student here at Columbia, how science was different then than it is now and how technology was different then than it is now. So I was born in 1943. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was the president. Uh, World War II was raging in the far Pacific and in Europe. And uh, what was the state of science at that point? Well, um, <coughs> structure of DNA was not known, you know, at that point. It was, I think people believe that uh, the DNA in the cell carried the <coughs> heredity somehow or another. The message was in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the DNA, but the structure and the mechanism completely unknown. Biology at that time was a macroscopic descriptive science, mostly just, uh, you know, uh, putting animals and plants into different groups, you know, categorizing on the macroscopic scale. You know, now we're um, 80 years later, biology has been completely transformed from this macroscopic scale to a microscopic science based on chemistry, right? <coughs> Structure of DNA has just transformed everything. You know, we understand heredity now. It's a great impact on society and uh, criminology, and uh, people use it to. Uh, we have a complete genome now for the Neanderthals. All of this during my lifetime. Earth science is completely transformed. We understand now about uh, you know plate tectonics and. <clears throat> how to use modern tools to understand what's really going on, the use of magnetism to, dis discuss, to understand the spreading of the seafloor. Astrophysics totally transformed in my lifetime, you know. Um, I mean, nobody was thinking about DNA. I mean, excuse me, nobody was thinking about black holes back in 1943, I think. What's his name? Um, Oppenheimer published an article in 1939 where he discussed it a little bit, but there were no computers, no digital this or digital that. Science was based on analytical solutions. You know, my undergraduate training was expansion of wave functions in complete sets, <laughs> filter space. <laughs> you know, and all these different ways of, you know, doing this. So in, I went to high school in um, late 1950s in suburban Kansas City. Um, great big public high school. My father had been raised during the Great Depression and supported himself, you know, and he was very much of the mind that I should work. <laughs> I shouldn't have any free time. You know, and so in fact, when I was in high school, uh, I worked 24, I had, 
24 hours a week, half full time, working in a hardware store. So that was one of the most productive things I did in high school, was I learned about what goes on in a hardware store. <laughs> you know, to be a lab scientist, that's essential to know about tools and bolts and screws and all, and all of that, because especially valuable for me because I was more theoretically inclined and not really inclined to do that, you know. Sometimes I joke that the most important class I took in high school was touch typing. <laughs> because in fact, you know, well there was, you know, um, I, there was a hole in my schedule. I took touch typing for one semester. That came in value, that it became valuable 25 years later when I taught myself how to work on a word processor when this first came out. There was an, I think it was called WordPerfect or something like this. It was before the uh, Microsoft took over everything. <coughs> no calculus in high school. I showed up at Rice without any understanding of calculus, despite the fact this was a high school that had uh, um, 500 people in the graduating class or something like that. So I went down to Rice in, in uh, Houston, Texas to start um, undergraduates. You know, looking back at this now, I would say this was a tough engineering school, the way I remember it. And uh, it was very different now than academic life. We had classes six days a week, lectures on Saturday morning. And the freshmen, there was a required curriculum for freshmen, you know, freshman math, learning through calculus, English, American history. American history at eight o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. <laughs> and the, um, the guy who taught it was the dean of the college, and he was of the opinion that if he was gonna be there at eight o'clock in the morning, you were gonna be there also. <laughs> no sleeping in. And so if in fact you didn't show up, you had to sit in a chair with had this number on the back and they took attendance this way. If you didn't, if you didn't show up, he sent a letter to your father about <laughs> to make sure that you were serious about this education. So I was a uh, chemical physics major as an undergraduate. And I think this was the, uh, I was the first chemical physics major to go through Rice. The president was Ken Pitzer at that time. He did chemical physics, you know, so when he, he came to Rice, one of the first thing he did, he did was to institute this chemical physics major. That meant that every semester I basically took one course in physics, one course in math, and one course in chemistry. Eight semesters of undergraduate mathematics. And I sometimes think maybe that was too much, you know, because I learned all kinds of things in math that I never used for anything, you know. <laughs> it was a very academic math curriculum. Theorem, lemma, proof. Theorem, lemma, proof. One after the other, you know, in the second year. And there was no grade inflation in those days compared to now. <laughs> Uh, at junior level, there was two semesters of uh, differential equations. And all of the undergraduate engineers were in that class. You know, the price was principally engineering. All the, they all had to take two semesters of differential equations. And I was in that class, and I guess the physics majors were in that class. So there was like 75 people who, in that class, first semester. Uh, there were, let's see if I remember correctly, three A minuses, maybe six Bs, and the rest were C, Ds, and Fs, you know. Uh, despite the fact everybody was a major and, you know, the class was important to them. Not a very good education in chemistry, you know, my organic that, that's been a problem all my life is I didn't really understand organic chemistry, didn't really understand inorganic chemistry. My organic chemistry class as a sophomore was taught by an elderly gentleman who had gotten his PhD in 1926. <laughs> he did not understand quantum mechanics. He did not understand spectroscopic characterization of organic compounds. And so the class was a series of named reactions. You know, 
and it was memorization, just these, this reaction, that reaction, that reaction, and he would write them on the board, a little bit of a kind of a mechanism, you know, of the old style, G. N. Lewis style of mechanism. That class drove me nuts. <laughs> I was really upset by the end of the, fall, of the spring semester. A lousy class in inorganic chemistry looking at it back as well. One thing that did work well was, uh, you know, I had come out of high school thinking that history was just a list of dates and the names of people, you know, and things like this. But the, had very vivid lectures on American history at eight o'clock in the morning in my freshman year. <laughs> that got me really fired up about history, and I really, that's been a lifelong deep interest of mine, American history and all kinds of history. If you come to my house, you see there are books all over the living room on the, in the Okay. So I have said a little bit about this education. Entirely classical, as I say, no computers, first computer I saw, digital computer, was uh, IBM 1620. It worked on punch cards, you know. It was about the size of a great big device, about the size of three seats across like this, you know, and about waist high like this. The undergraduates used it to do least squared fits on, uh, to get straight lines, you know, pro pro uh, programming in Fortran. So this was Rice. Um, I had gone to Rice on, as a Navy scholarship student, and I was, you know, on uh, commissioned after I graduated as a, you know, ensign in the Navy and then eventually lieutenant. As part of this training, every summer I went out to uh, serve in the fleet to learn something about what it was life, what life was like in the real Navy. Um, this made at least, I mean, a very vivid impression on me as a, as a young kid just out of high school. You know, you could imagine, I don't, none of you have served in the Navy, but boy, it's different than academic life. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first summer, you know, I got on a Greyhound bus, went across country to San Diego, and went out to the dock and took a water taxi out to, let's see if I get this straight, to this ship, which was in the harbor. This is a World War II destroyer from, built in 1943. And I served it for, on board for seven weeks in the summer of 1962. And you can see it's, uh, it's uh, the Navy had not modernized it one bit by the time when I, so it was a time capsule from World War II. Shows you exactly the technology, 1939, 1941, when they were putting this ship together to build it. It's a gunship, you can see there, one, two, three, four, five, uh, five inch, 38, five inches the diameter of the, of the shell, 38 is the caliber of the, of the barrel guns, so it was supposed to be shooting at other surface ships, and it, you know, it was just like in the movies, there was a, a uh, roll, just, it rolled uh, depth charges off the back. This is a search radar on the top. Radar had been invented, you know, by the German, by the English in the 1930s, and by the time this ship came out, was built in 43, they had perfected a, um, a, a radar, localized radar for uh, tracking targets. Besides this search radar, which is on top up here, um, as I say, it was a uh, just time cap capsule from 1943. Uh, this is a control panel in the engine room down at the bottom of the ship. You see all of these gauges and these big valves that the sailors had to turn. Uh, this, is a, this is a steam driven ship. So boilers, two steam boilers and high pressure steam would turn turbines and they would have series of reduction gears 
to adjust the speed of the propeller, you know, high and low, uh, fast and slow. When the ship is in outside, when the ship is sailing, then this equipment has to be monitored day and night. So that a sailor on board would work all day long, and then at night he'd have to take a watch, basically. Eight to 12, eight to midnight. Midnight or midnight to 4 a.m. Or 4 a.m. to eight o'clock in the morning. If you went on a watch at 4 a.m., then you had to, you know, you worked all the next day. And then maybe you'd have a different watch the following night. Watch in the engine room, as I remember, midnight. So you would just go to bed at eight, sleep for several hours, somebody would come and wake you up. Then you'd have to go down to the engine room and stand watch, you know, looking at this panel. <laughs> How does help? <laughs> you know, and you can see this asbestos covering all the pipes in the back. <laughs> Everything was covered with asbestos in that ship. Also, some nights I stood watch on the bridge. Um, first Russian satellites were coming across. And so out in the Pacific, you know, there's no background light. And you see this beautiful um, display of the stars up there. You see these first Russian satellites coming across, you know, blinking, kind of blinking and going across the sky relatively fast. So what was the ship doing? The ship was preparing to go overseas to the Western Pacific. So every day it would come out of San Diego and um, we'd practice in the daytime or help submarines in the daytime. So it's, some of the time we served as a target ship <laughs> for the American submarines for practice. Remember standing on the bridge, looking out at 45 degrees with respect to the bow and a, Torpedo comes right under the bridge. <laughs> Practice torpedo. They were shooting at us, you know, we were providing a target. The main thing that I remember was the fire control system. And let me talk about that now. <laughs> Nothing was so this is the first computer that I actually saw. It is the fire control system on board this Navy ship. Mark one, that means that was the first practical computer they put into the ships. This is an electromechanical computer with no storage, no programming, you know, just hardwired to solve a specific problem. And uh, the problem was, how to aim the guns, you know, if you want to shoot an enemy plane like that, the plane is flying forward like this, so you have to lead the target, depending on how fast the shells go. It's a difficult problem because, you know, the ship itself is maybe making a turn like this, and that affects the angle at which the guns are aimed, and the ship is rocking back and forth, left and right, you know, and maybe pitching forward and back like this. So all of this has to be taken into account mechanically. There was, a, there was a gyroscope in the bowels of the ship and the electrical readout from the, from the gyroscope went into this device. And also the uh, uh, fire control radar, you know, went into this device and what went out of the device was electrical signals to the gun and how to aim the ships how to aim the guns in real time. Dials on the top here, you can see on the side here, there are all these little hand cranks. So when this was operating, there were maybe five or six sailors standing all around. It was, again, about the size of this IBM 1620, you know, a great big device like this. All kinds of data had to be put in by hand, you know, that were not electrically measured. I remember one of these dials on the side here was the temperature of the shells in the magazine because if the, if the shell was a little bit hotter it would go further like that and they had to they had to correct for that to get an accurate here's the top 
And you can see more of these cranks on the side like this, and there are all these dials showing which thing is pointing in which direction like this, and say they would crank this and that and that and that. Real-time manual correction of the data in the computer. <coughs> when it was working, it would lock on to, it was very good against surface ships, you know, so if you had, suppose you had a ship 10 miles out, you know, and, and, and the, the <coughs> radar would lock onto that, and once the thing was in real time, giving real time directions to the gun, you could stand on the bridge, look back at the five guns, and you could see them, as if the ship was rocking a little bit like this, you could see the barrels going up, down, up, down to compensate for the uh, rocking of the ship. I mean, one of the loudest things I ever heard was when the, these five guns went off at the same time, you know, broadside, broadside out, shooting out. So this worked well against ships. It did not work very well against uh, airplanes. If there was just one airplane flying along like this, relatively slow, the system could lock on. That's the other thing I should say, is that this was a slow computer. <laughs> you know, so, and training, training the guns was a slow process, so it didn't respond very fast to any change you know, in, the, in the fire control problem. Single ship coming, single airplane going across, it might do a decent job of aiming, aiming the guns. So in, in the spring of uh, you know, 1945, the last battle in the Pacific was the invasion of Okinawa. And uh, the Navy's job was to, and this ship was there, the weather bird was there, um, you know, help protect the invading force, the Marines and the Army, you know, and to, relatively close to Japan. Kamikazes would come out of Japan in waves of hundreds at a time. Ships like this, all these destroyers were trying to survive in that environment. And they could do pretty well against one or two airplanes coming in, but this computer only really worked against one, sh one target at one time. If you had 15 or 20 kamikazes all coming in at the same time from different angles, one was going to get through. That turned out to be a very tough battle. You know, the Navy lost 35 ships to kamikazes standing off of, hunk, off of uh, Okinawa. And my father was out there actually on, on the troop, troop transport at that time besides the wedding burn. 5,000 dead sailors because this fire control didn't work well. Five, in, in addition, 5,000 severely injured sailors, 35 ships sunk. They clearly needed better equipment. You know? So it, it, the whole, since then, they've worked really hard on modern you know, um, electronics and modern guns and improving everything. So this was my experience in the summer of 1962 off San Diego. Two summers later, 64, I was on a modern aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. So this aircraft carrier had the Franklin Roosevelt, had the best of everything the Navy could make at that point, basically. Uh, 4,000 sailors on board this ship maybe a hundred jet fighters like this, you know. And uh, the sequence of events, this is showing a, a supply ship, basically. You know, oil hoses is coming across, and uh, they practice uh, refueling the ship at sea like this. You know, the typical cycle was that a ship like this would stay in port for 12 months or maybe 15 months, months and it was getting ready to go on deployment. When it went on deployment, it was gone. It was going to be out there eight months, basically following that. So the crew was built up and everything was repaired, and then it went out into the Pacific, or into the, in this case, in the Mediterranean. And when I got on board, I figured out that what is the mission of the ship? 
the mission of this ship is to attack the Soviet Union and the Ukraine with nuclear weapons in the case of war. You know, this is at a time when we were in a cold war with the Soviet Union and there was a, this mindless race to build more and more new, the Russians have 5,000 hydrogen bombs, we should have 5,000. Russians have 10,000, we should have 10,000. And this was going as fast as it could. So this ship had, in fact, on board 100 hydrogen bombs. Hmm. In the case of war, well, first they had to be ready to launch, you know, it might come at 2 in the morning, this, uh, you know, the starting of the war. So they had to be able to practice. They had to be able to launch everybody in the middle of the night in the dark, as well as in the daytime. Constant practice when it was on deployment in the Mediterranean. You know, so the pilots are taking off of the land, uh, some sorties at night, some in the daytime. They had to keep practicing landing, taking off, landing, and taking off because that's a difficult skill on an aircraft carrier. And you keep your skill up, you had to, you know, you couldn't go six months without a landing and then expect to be able to land your jet anymore on the, on the, on the aircraft carrier. So again, I was, uh, I remember standing on the back of the bridge here, watching them come in one after the other, these really loud fires. Here's the jet fighter on board the ship. I think this is an A-1 carrying the first practical hydrogen bomb that could be mounted on a Navy plane. This is a Mark 7 nuclear weapon. And there's a hundred of these on board the ship. And um, so this is what they had, you know, they, this is what they configured to take off into the, into the Ukraine. I got to know some of the pilots. They considered it a suicide mission. Hmm. You know, you can imagine. You take off from the aircraft carrier in the middle of the night. You fly across the Black Sea, Black Sea into Ukraine. Maybe drop 50. I mean, all these, all the fighters, 80 some going at the same time. You drop these hyd hydrogen bombs, different cities, different places. Tremendous explosions everywhere, shock waves, things like this. Pilots somehow had to survive after this in the in the midst of all this craziness. They thought they would never make it back to the, to the ship because you know they, they would probably be driven down by one of these explosions. Or when, if if the fighter was lucky enough to make it back to the ship in the Mediterranean, maybe four or six hours later, the ship may be sunk by the Russians at that point. So, suicide mission. Here's just a picture of the fighter plane with all the different types of weapons it carried. I think this is the hydrogen bomb I'm showing you there. Maybe two and a half feet in diameter, maybe eight feet long. You can tell from that. From the Navy had worked extremely hard with Los Alamos in the time after World War II to get these things small enough and more efficient enough that they could be actually carried by uh, a, small, a small fighter like this. You know, and so this was a big breakthrough. The Navy wanted to prove to the government that it could be participate along with the Air Force in when atomic war came with the Russians. I mean, it's a danger. So even without considering these hydrogen bombs, flying on an aircraft carrier like this is a dangerous business. So I was there maybe six weeks on board the carrier. Three pilots died in, that, in the six weeks that I was on board. They were practicing in the daytime, practicing at nighttime. I got to know one of these pilots. I went into uh, Piraeus, Greece to stand shore patrol. So, just like in the movies, you know, you have all these sailors on leave and they're going in and out of the bars of Piraeus. And so I was on in a Jeep with a lieutenant pilot and a third class petty officer or something like this. Our job was to go up and down the streets looking for trouble involving the uh, sailors, you know, who were getting drunk and so forth. So I got to know this guy pretty well in the course of the evening and 
He had a wife and a child back in Florida. A week later on board the aircraft carrier, I look on the bulletin board and it says there's a memorial service for this pilot. Hmm. And I asked, what the heck happened to this guy? And he was flying one of the most modern fighters and uh, uh, he launched off the carrier at midnight in the total darkness. Flew out over the Mediterranean, you know, in the dark. And the fighter got about 20 miles out and it just exploded into small pieces. Small pieces came down, they never recovered anything. The pilot was lost like this. Dangerous business. These jet fighters were very complicated and they were maintained by young sailors, you know, 20 year old sailors, just out of high school, more or less, or something like that. <clears throat> a pilot in the Navy had a 50% chance of crashing if he stayed for a career, hmm. you know. Go back and look at this at these images again. Let's see. You know, once a fire started on something like this, suppose they were launching airplanes, you know, and the airplanes were full of gasoline, they had bombs underneath them. There were you know, there's gasoline in, in pipes along on the deck like this. The interior of the ship is full of the gasoline. There are more bombs down below. So if a fire started in a situation like that, it was very hard to put it out. You know, there, there were ships off Vietnam like this, and uh, twice they had a large aircraft carriers accident on the main deck. When it's like a rocket went off, when it wasn't supposed to an accident on the main deck. That set off bombs and rockets into other airplanes that were parked nearby. Fire blew, got bigger and bigger, blew holes in the deck. Hundred sailors would die in the in you know just fighting the fire to keep the whole ship from sinking like that. It's a dangerous situation, especially you think about that now with the nuclear weapons on board. Oh yeah, there was also a, a, there was a collision when I was in this. So the aircraft carrier had to operate in the day and night at any time. This replenishment ship had to operate in the day or night at any time, so they were able to transfer oil at two in the morning as well as in the daytime. And this is an this is an oiler, but they you know the other ship there were ammunition ships that were transferring bombs in the middle of the night by sling from one side one to the other like this. One night I was uh, going to sleep. Uh, about 11 p.m. You know, in Iraq, they were like, you know, in the movies, there were like four racks, one above each other from the floor to the ceiling. And on the PA system, it says, collision alert. Mm. And then maybe 10 seconds later, I feel this bump. Mm. Aircraft carrier hit an ammunition ship. So, <clears throat> you know, so the ammunition ship is here in the middle of the night, there are bombs on the deck getting ready to transfer, and so the way it works, this one is it sails a steady course. Air, aircraft carrier comes up in the total darkness and has to slide it alongside like this. There's a Bernoulli effect, you know, so when two objects in the water come close together, there's a force pulling them together. And the guy in charge on the aircraft carrier didn't judge that right, and so when he came up, he scraped all along the outer side like this and popped off a bunch of wires and things like this. Thank heavens he didn't set it off. <laughs> but you know, it's dangerous, especially if they had weapons on the top like that. So what happened in the and so what happened in the subsequent years, you know, they put nuclear weapons everywhere on the surface navy. On destroyers, there were torpedoes that the destroyer could launch out and I think a nuclear warhead to it against a submarine like this. They had rockets, you know, that had nuclear warheads instead of conventional war, you know, to... Thank heavens, about 1990, President Bush, the elder President Bush, uh, took these, all these tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons off Navy ships, surface ships like this. So what was left was a submarine force and B-52s, the Air Force, you know, took the attack on Russia. <laughs> But he eliminated all these surface weapons 
That was a unilateral decision on his part. And a few days later, the Russians, you know, copied that, you know, and uh, I think Gorbachev uh, agreed. To, you know, he said, well, if the Americans were going to do this, then the, uh, he would take his, his weapons off as well. The army had nuclear cannons, you know, basically like, like this, all kinds of weapons everywhere, small rockets, you know. So that was my experience in the Navy. You can imagine what that was like, how different that is than just studying calculus or physics as an undergraduate at <laughs> Rice, uh, learning something about this old technology. So I went back after that summer, I went back to uh, my senior year at Rice and In the fall of my senior year at Rice, Lyndon Johnson ordered the Marines into Vietnam. That turned out to be a terrible decision, you know, in retrospect, 1964. And uh, the country very quickly went into, uh, became more and more unstable. There were massive riots in 1968, massive riots on the Columbia campus when I was here as a graduate student, 1968, you know, and. Uh, all because of this. So let me talk a little bit about what it was like to be a graduate student here at that time my experience. I again was a chemical physics uh, PhD student at Rice, I mean at, at Columbia here. Coming in in the fall of uh, uh, 1965. What that meant in a practical sense was that I took a number of graduate courses in the physics department, but at the same time, all my friends and my research interests, the problems I thought about were in chemistry, basically. Ron Runslow was here. He'd been here maybe 10 years. In those days, you first academic rank, first academic rank was lecturer. He had been a lecturer, and then after several years, he'd been promoted to assistant professor. I can remember Tom Cass lecturing on Huffle theory and aromatic behavior, anti-aromatic you know, anti behavior. Nick Turrell was here. He'd been, I think he was three years into his appointment, you know, doing photochemistry. Bruce Byrne, Steve Lippert showed up, I think, either the first or second year I was in grad school and started their academic careers. Harry Gray was here. He was teaching freshman physics, freshman chemistry. Very enthusiastic teacher. I was one of his TAs who had to grade, who had to grade exams. With a vivid memory of grading this uh, final exam with him and the other maybe 10 or 15 graduate students involved on a Saturday morning in the faculty room, faculty Miller, you know, the faculty room of the Havemeyer Hall. All these questions, each one had partial questions, you know, going through this long mess. It was a very cohesive faculty in those days, I think probably more so than now. Um, there was a colloquium on Thursday. Faculty would go out for dinner at that point. Then they'd come back, and there'd be problem session after dinner in Havemeyer. You know, and so many people participated in this, and they tried to put put problems on the board, and the faculty would discuss, the grad students would discuss, how could we approach this, and so forth. There was a greater sense that the other departments at the university were the enemy at that time. You know, and we we had to stick together in order to uh, survive in the difficult situation. Took courses in physics. One I remember very well is learning quantum mechanics with G.C. Wick, an old time theorist from the 1930s. Uh, took mathematical methods with, in physics and E&M. E&M, probably the most important course I took. You know, so those two classes saved my neck as I got older because you know, I was able to learn things after I left graduate school. <coughs> 
in Bell Labs and here at Columbia, learned things I had never, I never knew anything about. But because I had this fundamental training in <coughs> basic ideas of uh, physics, if you will, or physics applied to molecules, I could teach myself what was going on in these fields. Everything I used, basically, was I learned after graduate school, I mean, with this exception like that. Let me talk a little bit about the culture. Certainly, there was discrimination against women in those days. I'm talking about 1965, 1967. You know, entering graduate class you know, in chemistry of 42 students, only two of which were, were women. There was, um, many faculty felt that it was a waste of time to, to uh, teach women how to do PhD level of science because they were just gonna go, go get married and have children and they never would practice the science. When I got to Bell Labs later on, you know, there was a common, very strong effort by the management to uh, affirmative action for women, basically. And sometimes in these sessions, the uh, 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 white male, you know, would stand up and say, I don't know why the hell we're doing all of this. My mother taught me a woman's places in the home. You know, so that was a very standard attitude in those days. There was actually one black graduate student in chemistry at the time of World War II, Lincoln Hawkins. And he earned a PhD about 1945, and I read recently an account that said that he was good friends with all the other graduate students in the department, but they could not go and eat dinner on Broadway because there was no restaurant on Broadway here in 1945 that would accept a black patron. There had been discrimination against Jews before that. When I got to Columbia, the faculty was half Jewish, you know, basically. But in the 1930s, there was a lot of resistance to Jewish students and Jewish uh, uh, faculty. In Bell Labs as well in the 1930s, because they, you know, they had a scientific engineering staff that was um, all white males, and the, the, the administration understood, understood that if they started hiring even Italians or Jews like, like that, there would uh, be a lot of resistance. It would cause lots of trouble in, in, the, you know, in the ranks of the, of, the, of the scientific workers if they, if they tried to push this into things they didn't want to go into. Of course, all of that changed. It's another measure of the progress that's been made you know, since that time. <coughs> Things are not perfect, but things are a lot better than when I went off to graduate school. Affirmative action for women has been um, worked especially well. Now half the women in chemistry are, uh, half the <coughs> professional workers in chemistry are women. Isn't that true? I went to colloquia in physics and in chemistry. In the phys physics colloquia, uh, Robbie, T.D. Lee were sitting in the front row all the time asking questions. Um, at that point, what, I think in 1965, they wanted to learn something about DNA, the, the physicists. And they didn't understand anything about molecules, but boy, they were going to learn something about DNA because it was important <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and so they, they invited Bob Schulman to come. He, he was working on electronic states, and, and I remember T.D. Lee understanding, trying to understand what the triplet state was in a molecule. <laughs> Long discussion back and forth at that point. <laughs> on the, on the uh, physics faculty was Will Happer, and very smart, original thinker in atomic physics, basically. And I got to know him, and uh, he's a delightful man, strong Christian. You know, in recent years, he's uh, notorious because of his opposition to the uh, uh, consensus view of global warming, you know, that CO2 is the cause of this. He's a very original thinker, and he's the kind of guy who, he, if he's going to um, 
think if he thinks something is important, he doesn't want to take anyone else's word for it. He's going to sit down and, and just figure it out for himself from scratch, from the original data. Um, it's a shame he got into this mess he's in now, basically. He's probably just, you know, the best scientist who doesn't really believe in uh, global warming at this point. He's down at Princeton, tenured professor at Princeton. I mean, he left because uh, T.D. Lee sort of ran the physics department, and T.D. Lee didn't think much of solid state physics, and T.D. Lee did not think much of atomic theory. Everyone should work on high energy physics, you know. Chemistry colloquia. Peter Redzepis came in the fall of 65 to try and explain to the faculty what mode locking is. I remember this lecture very clearly. A little pulse running back and forth inside, inside the cavity like this. Ben, ben Widdham came from Cornell. He was trying to talk about uh, critical points in phase transitions and this kind of funny mathematics that describes the critical point. Uh, Lee Hirschbach came from Harvard talking about uh, cross beams. You know. So if I had to characterize physical chemistry in those days, it was you know, if you had a Hamiltonian in your, the problem that you were working on, that was good. And if it wasn't the Hamiltonian in the problem, that was bad, like that. <laughs> and they were trying to, the physical chemists were going deeper and deeper and deeper into the application of quantum mechanics to molecules, you know, and, like that, and understanding reactions. And so how am I doing on time? I'm gonna, it's all right, we're just 20 minutes past. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So he was trying to work out the, uh, you know, reaction dynamics with cross molecular beams like this. That was the, kind of the leading experiment, the most creative experiment that was in physical chemistry at that time. Tremendously hard, as you might imagine, to get back in high enough to do that. So basically, I left graduate school understanding almost nothing about thermodynamics. And I don't think I understood the second law of thermodynamics until I was 10 years back at Columbia, trying to teach this every year to the undergraduates, you know, to freshmen. You know. <laughs> it, slowly, it slowly dawned on me, you know, that this is really an important subject. <laughs> Irreversibility, you know, and the language itself just was a barrier. Part of it, after I came back to Columbia as a, as a professor, Roger Penrose is here, and he spoke about the second law of, of thermodynamics applied to the um, early years of the universe. That got my attention, you know, <laughs> when they, I went to hear him speak. So uh, I thought I would, the last thing I'd like to do is, is uh, talk a little bit about the life of Harold Urey as an example of how things change so dramatically over one person's lifetime in science. Yuri <coughs> was a professor at Columbia starting in about 1930s, and he became very famous because he discovered deuterium. Uh, uh, so he was born about 1890 or thereabouts, and um, uh, poor, lived on a dirt farm in northern Indiana. He knew how to pull, plow using horse to pull, to pull the plow, you know. Worked, worked with you know a hoe in the, in the garden like that. They sold the vegetables to the town. As far as I can tell, he never actually was hungry, but the family was close to not having enough food. And he went to school eventually. He graduated from high school in a small little town in Indiana. They were so short of so short of teachers that they invited him to teach grade school as soon as he, he left high school. Hmm. So he taught for three years 
grade school, the farm children, wanted to try and learn some more science, went off to the University of Montana, um, where he had relatives. He said that the first time he saw an automobile was at age 17 in rural Montana. Mm. So he knew about horses, he knew about farm animals, but he'd never seen an automobile. Certainly never, you know, this complexity was way beyond him like that. Majored in chemistry as it existed at that time. Worked as an industrial chemist during World War I in order to, I mean, that helped, that kept him out of the draft. He learned all kinds of practical chemistry, you know, working uh, for those years during the war. And uh, after the war, he wanted to go to grad school and learn about, more about basic science. He went to Berkeley. He worked with G.N. Lewis directly, got a PhD in two years, working for G.N. Lewis. Uh, this is before the Schrodinger equation which was, you know, invented. There was an old quantum mechanics that, that existed at that time that was based on the Bohr model for the atom, you know, and elaborations of this. And he and G.N. Lewis worked on how you might apply this uh, statistical mechanics based on quantum mechanics to the to, mo to molecules. Got a scholarship, went to work with Bohr for a year in Europe. And he learned there that he was far from being the smartest guy in the class. <laughs> His, you know, so he just couldn't keep up with modern quantum mechanics. But he was driven to find important problems, you know. And he had all kinds of practical knowledge. He knew how to work with his hands. calcium carbonate from the bottom of the ocean and he's drilling out a sample of it. In the same way in the modern age, people would drill into a tooth of a Neanderthal to extract <coughs> the DNA. He was a hands-on experimentalist. So in the 1930s, chemists were beginning to work on, about 1930s were beginning to work on isotopes. And the, oops, they knew that Chlorine had two isotopes, you know, and uh, there was also oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. And so they were trying to go through all of this. I guess it had been known since World War I, the end of World War I, that the isotopes existed for, for the elements. So Yuri sat down by himself and he said, what's the most important thing I can do with isotopes? And he said, well, the most important one, the most important one would be hydrogen itself, you know, the hydrogen atom, uh, because there the mass would have a tremendous effect. It'd be a factor of two like that, change all the physical properties like this. So there was no evidence that there, that uh, deuterium existed, but he took it took it on himself to try and find a way to do it, and he re he he rationed, he realized that. <coughs> Um, physical processes, you know, like evaporation from the liquid or something like that, 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 would, that would offer a route to um, separate isotopes. And so he convinced a friend down at the Bureau of Standards to distill liquid hydrogen at four degrees Kelvin or something like that, maybe 20 degrees Kelvin, that's where the hydrogen and uh, with the idea that the hydrogen, lighter, the lighter molecules would come off and it would leave the heavier isotope concentrated in the remaining residue. So I think they distilled something like a one liter down to one cubic centimeter. He was an also, so they brought that back to Columbia, that sample. Uh, he also, Yuri was a good enough spectroscopist to know that the Rydberg constant for the hydrogen atom depends slightly on mass. Because you know, it's, there's a what is the word? The electron and the nucleus are cir circulating each other. There's a center of mass problem like this, and there that would 
mass of two versus the mass of one would make a difference. Enough that you could resolve it. Maybe one angstrom on a high, on atomic emission line. And so he, he took, in the basement of Pupin at that time, there was a 21 foot spectrograph, just been, in, you know, had just been turned on by the atomic physicists in the physics department. He used that to look at this uh, discharge in the residue and then also natural hydrogen. And it was this line position for deuterium was a factor of five stronger, you know, in the concentrated residue. That was a proof, experimental proof, that there was a, a heavy element in hydrogen and in water, obviously. had a revolutionary effect in chemistry. He won Nobel Prize within two years of this discovery like that. Um, he kept working on this and he, they figured out very quickly that in the, this uh, distillation process that I guess what I'm trying to say is the electrolysis of water gave an even better sample than the evaporation. Uh, you know, it, it gave almost pure heavy isotope. There was a, in, in Europe, there was a, a Norse Hydro was the uh, uh, company in, in uh, Norway that was distilling. So when they read Yuri's paper, they distilled it all the way down like that, Norse Hydro, and they got pure deuterium water cheaply. It was used all over chemistry and uh, as I say it made a big difference. So in the 1930s he, he, he and his students began to work on uh, uh, the isotope separation in general. He had a, a female student in the 1930s, Mildred Cohen. She graduated, you know, and he said Never again will I take a woman student, going back to this issue of discrimination. And the reason was it was so hard for him to try and find a job for her. There were no jobs for women PhDs, you know, and he just, there was also a grad student, a prospective grad student who came to talk to him in the 1930s, who was Jewish. And he said, and he was at this time I mean, he would surely be the chairman of the department. But he advised a student not to come because of the systematic discrimination against Jews in the 1930s. So you can see what science was like back in those days. Um, no different than the, than the civilian popula population as a whole. World War II came, you know, and this separation, the uranium separation was a, a very big issue. And uh, he was right on top of that from the beginning. He was doing calculations on the separation you could get from in the uranium hexafluoride between, you know, between the two isotopes, calculations on paper, uh, separation in a centrifuge before anywhere ever, ever built. And he began in Havemeyer to do he and his colleagues in the engineering and physics here on the campus, they began to do research, try to do research on this. Very quickly, very quickly, federal government realized how important this was. You know, after Einstein's letter came in and uh, they began to fund research in isotope separation. They began to fund Yuri maybe a month or two after he started to think about this problem. And six months later, at the beginning of 1942, such a large program had developed, they appointed Dury to be the head of the entire chemical isotope separation project in, in the United States as they're building up for the war effort. Ernest Lawrence was the head of the physical separation you know, in the mass spectrometer, and the two of them ran this program during the war. That was very hard for Dury. He was not the good administrator. You know, he had like 500 people who reported to him, not directly, but um, you know, in various groups around the country. Very happy to give it up. At the end of the war, he was convinced that you know, nuclear weapons were a bad thing. He went around the country speaking against nuclear weapons. In that process, he became a very good friend of Einstein. Einstein was also very 
you know, against, uh, very strongly opposed to the nuclear weapons. Uh, you can see I'm losing my breath a little bit here. They were of the same generation, older than most of the physicists who had worked on, on weapons like that. They became very good friends. After the war, he moved to the University of Chicago. He was drafted to serve on a PhD exam in, biology, in geology. And I guess the, the candidate was talking about uh, how you determine physical characterization, you know, and he mentioned this problem of uh, they didn't know what the temperature was on the Earth a long time ago when the rocks were laid down and so forth. Yuri realized that he knew how to do, how to figure out the temperature from his isotope separation work. You know, if you consider the uh, formation of carbonate rocks, it's carbon dioxide plus aqueous water react to form carbonate, which then with so, which calcium would make calcium carbonate. That reaction, the equilibrium constant for that reaction slightly depends upon the mass of the oxygen, O18 versus O16, because the energy level structure is different. You, when you make the partition, you, you know, this, you do the statistical mechanics analysis of the equilibrium constant, you know, level structure is different in the deuterium molecule, I mean, in the oxygen 18 by a little bit, and so it's enough, but it's enough you could measure. And he also realized that this would apply to the snowing forming ice. You know, and so he, he, he figured out that you could tell the age of an ice sample from the ratio of O18 to O16. That was revolutionary for geology, because the geologists now had a method you know, to determine the um, temperature at the time of formation you know, in the ice fields. And so the further you drill down into the ice cap on Greenland, you're going back in time, you measure the ratio of the two isotopes as a function of the depth, you get how, what the temperature was when it snowed originally like that. Little bubbles exist in the ice, you know, and these, these bubbles, in fact, are samples of the atmosphere from that time, 400,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. So all of that led to this correlation of, you know, the, you, you see this, this famous picture of um, CO2 concentration of the atmosphere periodic and time going back like this as the ice ages come and go versus the uh, temperature at the time of the formation down in the like that. So that kept going and he, he, he himself worked on the mass spectrometer to measure the ratio. Built a machine that could measure one part in 10 to the fourth of the two ratio, the ratios. So this uh, there was one more colloquium that I haven't told you about that strikes in my mind uh, here at Columbia, and that was like in maybe about October of 1965, Harold Jury came back to speak. And I heard him speak here in chemistry, actually in the faculty room, and I was sitting about seven feet away from him, and he's talking about his current passion, which is the chemistry of the universe, chemistry of the solar system. And in particular, he had ideas about what chemistry might be going on in the surface of the moon. He spoke all about that. And once he got interested in that, you know, at Chicago, he performed this famous experiment at Chicago with, um, on the uh, origin of life. You know, at that time, people thought the original atmosphere was reducing on, on Earth and not oxidizing as we think now. So he ran this spark through uh, water vapor with ammonia above the, uh, more in a recirculating system, and they found uh, amino acids after a week of this sparking business. That had a revolutionary effect on these people who were trying to think about the origin of life. Very famous experiment. So you see in his life, um, he was always searching for a better problem. You know, and he had discovered deuterium, but he didn't stay with that. He went and worked for the government during World War II. He was a strong American patriot, and then he went into geology like this, and then he went into the origin of life. 
how much did things change during his life? He was a farm boy. He, you know, he, he plowed fields using horses. Very poor as a child, very poor as a young guy. So this whole evolution of life, you can't tell what's going to happen. And so sometimes I look at the, my grandchildren and I think, you know, how will the world change um, during their lifetime? Nobody knows. Uh, when I was born, there were no digital computers, no software, nobody thinking in that direction. Now look where we are now in terms of digital computers and uh, people are afraid that, that uh, this artificial intelligence is gonna take over the human race. Look how the world's been changed by the DNA, you know, all this development of the DNA. So as I said in that, you know, that one of the slides this morning, the uh, most important thing you can do is to try and keep learning new things all the time. And the choice of the problem. Yuri's great strength was that he chose good problems. You know, that had, had a good future and he himself could work on. He was not the smartest guy, for sure. You know, you know, without a doubt. Could not do advanced quantum mechanics, you know. But he understood practical chemistry, he understood how to use it and so forth. So I thought I would, so I've tried to tell you a little bit about all, all of this and especially what life was like as I remember it when I was an undergraduate and a grad student. And I tried to tell you a little bit about how this Navy had a big impression, made a big impression on me. You can imagine the difference between serving on these ships with the nuclear weapons compared with um, software calculus, junior level differential equations. Thank you very much for your attention.